Nancy. We ordered this beautiful day for you. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we appreciate it every day. We don't take it for granted, but it's especially appreciated on days when we share it with people who don't have a beautiful day like this every day like we do in the winter. Um, this is just a, a, a special occasion that we look forward to every year at Florida State. The opportunity to bring people from all around the country to talk about issues that are so important on our college campuses. It's a time when we reflect on uh, how we impact students' lives, how they make the most of their college experience, how they become the adults and leaders of our world that we need them to be to address all the issues that are facing our communities. And this theme in particular is one where we're really focusing on the future and preparing students and how do we on college campuses have the opportunity to impact them and, and help them prepare for uh, the challenges that they will be facing. So I'm excited about this theme and I'm also very excited about our keynote speakers and you'll be hearing more from them and about them uh, later on in the evening. So we look forward to that. Really appreciate everyone who submitted program proposals and is presenting. Those programs are a, an essential part of the learning that we have too, the opportunity to network with each other and think about things that we don't make time to think about during our daily lives. So I hope everybody will absorb the moment and as Cheryl Keene would say, reflect upon uh, what we're learning and apply that when we go back home to our home institutions. I want to thank um, Craig Beebe and Mallory Garcia before I go any further. You know that they are the hands and feet and brains of this operation. So Mallory and Craig, if you would stand so we can thank you. They were quite a team, and so it was fun to see um, their strengths complement each other during this time. Um, also, obviously want to uh, introduce to everybody who doesn't know Dr. John Dalton, who this institute is named after Dalton. He is the founder of the Dalton Institute, which was just called the Institute on College Student Values when he created it 25 years ago. If you'd stand, John, so we could thank you. <laughs> He's the faculty in residence for the Institute and is so important as we're developing the theme and thinking about which speakers um, will um, best um, exemplify that theme during the um, Institute. So we always enjoy that opportunity to brainstorm with uh, John Dalton. I'd also like to introduce and acknowledge some guests we have from our campus, from the FSU campus today. We have undergraduates who participate in the NASPA Knowles program. If you're familiar with the NASPA NUF program, this is our combination program where we have undergraduates here who are thinking about or intent upon becoming student affairs professionals, and so we invite them to take part in this day. If you're part of that, just wave for us. Welcome, undergraduates. <laughs> Croom, higher education um, and student affairs work that is an undergraduate course that um, we try to indoctrinate and brainwash <laughs> to go into the field of student affairs. So um, Allison does a wonderful job of that class and if you're in that class, wave to us. <laughs> I'm very proud to be Seminoles. Last year at this uh, very occasion, this first keynote speaker, the undergraduate students asked the most impressive questions. I was blown away. I was like, who are you? Uh, come take my job now. They were wonderful. Um, they also have a great relationship with the Character Clearing House, and um, we, I'd like to recognize Dr. Pam Crosby, who couldn't be with us tonight, but we really want to thank her with John in partnership as they um, edited the Journal for College and Character and also um, we affiliate with the Character Clearing House and we have Miguel Hernandez and Josh Davis who make the Character Clearing House come alive and I'd like to ask them to come to the podium now to talk a little bit about the Character Clearing House and invite you to be uh, more involved with that. Buenas noches y bienvenidos a la conferencia. Welcome. 
I'm excited to see so many familiar faces here with us in Tallahassee, and I'm also looking forward to meeting new colleagues and professionals to connect with. I have the privilege of serving as the editor of the Character Clearinghouse, and I look forward to sharing a little bit more about the work that we're doing in just a moment. Before I get too far, if any of you know I love to talk, before I get too far and comfortable with the microphone, I'd love to introduce my colleague. Good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Davis, and I serve as the associate editor for the Character Clearinghouse. And today I just want to tell you a little bit about what we do and who we are. So the Character Clearinghouse is an online center of information about research, curricula, and practices relating to the moral development of college students. We feature programs such as interviews, program descriptions, and best practices in various other types of articles. And this program was initiated by John C. Dalton with a grant from the John Templeton Foundation. It previously shared its home with the Journal for College and Character, and today is sponsored by the Office of Vice President of Student Affairs at Florida State University. A little bit about the, college, the Character Clearinghouse is we invite all faculty and higher education affiliates to submit programs, descriptions, information, links, and various media that will help further the discussion and research about moral and intellectual development of college students. In your program materials today, in, your, in the previous conference, we each received an invitation to share your recommendations, suggestions, and more regarding books, research, practices, and trailblazers in high, higher education. We invite you all to share your suggestions today and throughout the conference, and you can turn in any of your information at the registration tables throughout the conference. Something else that we're very excited to share with you is that over the past year, Josh and I have been working on putting together an editorial board to help us carry out and bring you the very best information possible. Um, I'd like to take a moment to thank the rest of the board members um, and acknowledge them for their work and their service. We have Ms. Amanda Bonilla from the Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis. We have Dr. Latoya Eves from Middle Tennessee State University. We are working with Ms. Jasmine Williams from Grand Valley State University. We're working with Ms. Chandra Meyer from Florida State University and Ms. Joy Phillips from Florida State University. If you all will please share with me and give them a round of applause for their work this year. Finally, we hope to see all of you join us at the closing uh, discussion panel that we're going to be having on Saturday entitled Reflections on Next Steps and Strategies on Minimizing Inequalities. On the panel, we will be hearing from several wonderful folks that are going to be joining us, and I wanted to share their names with you. Dr. Lara Perez Faulkner is an uh, assistant professor in higher education and sociology here at Florida State University. Our chief diversity officer at Florida State University, Ms. Renisha Gibbs, uh, also serves as the assistant vice president for human resources and the finance and administration chief of staff. She will be on the panel. Uh, Mr. Charlie Davis, our director of our TRIO Upward Bound program at, through the Center for Academic Retention and Enhancement will be on the panel. And also Mr. Juan Escalante, uh, who is a researcher in the Florida, excuse, excuse me, Florida Center for Reading and Research and also an activist uh, in our community. Um, those four folks will bring various perspectives to the conversation. Uh, we are very excited through our meetings and preparation for the panel and hope you will be able to join us for that event. We hope you all enjoy the Institute and look forward to the new thoughts, conversations, and critical reflections that will occur as we collectively examine this year's theme of widening inequalities. At this time, I'd like to invite Kat Callahan to introduce our keynote speaker for the evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Kat Callahan. I'm a fourth year doctoral student. I'm almost done. Go team. Um, and I have the distinct honor of introducing our keynote speaker, um, but I'm pretty sure he needs absolutely no introduction. Um, and I'm sure you're wondering why I'm only saying one Aston. Um, and unfortunately, his wonderful wife, Dr. Helen Aston, could not be here, and she was very sad that she couldn't be. Her birthday is tomorrow, and we will be planning some things, so stay tuned in the morning. We may be shooting some video clips and calling and singing happy birthday. Um, so that, that will stay tuned. Um, but the name Aston in the field of higher education is renowned. Uh, Drs. Alexander and Helen Aston are both well-published scholars, as you all know. None of us made it through our graduate programs without citing them multiple times <laughs> and reading all of their research. Um, and this isn't their first radio, I mean Dalton Institute. Uh, Dr. Alexander Aston presented in 1993 on promoting social responsibility. In 1996, Dr. Helen Aston presented on the critical role of values in student leadership development and education for citizenship. 
in 2004, they both presented separately on the topic of spiritual, student, student spirituality. And in 2010, they celebrated the 20th anniversary of the Institute, serving on a keynote roundtable with some of their friends and colleagues. Um, and I do want to say a little bit about Dr. Helen Asson um, because it's her birthday and because they worked very hard on this presentation together. Um, so Dr. Helen Asson is a distinguished professor emerita of higher education and a senior scholar in, at the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA. And her research focuses on education and career development for women, uh, faculty performance and rewards, leadership, and spirituality. So now I wonder how many of you know how the Addams Family, Lord of the Rings, and TV shows like Facts of Life and Bones connect, direct, uh, uh, connect directly with student development and student values? Anybody know? Yeah. Oh, a couple hands raised. Um, the answer is, in fact, our keynote, uh, Dr. Alexander Addison. And you guys can Google those things later. Um, but as a huge Lord of the Rings fan, this was a very happy moment for me. Um, Dr. Aston is the Alan M. Carter Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Higher Education and the founding director of the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA. He is also the founding director of the Cooperative Institutional Research Program, the nation's largest and oldest study of college students and faculty. Previously, he was the director of research for both the American Council on Education and the National Merit Scholarship Corporation. Author of over 20 books and some 300 other publications in the field of higher education, Dr. Aston has been a recipient of awards for outstanding research from 13 national associations, a fellow at Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences, and a recipient of 11 honorary degrees. 11. That's a lot of uh, and is a member of the National Academy on Education. In both 1990 and 2010, the Journal of Higher Education identified <coughs> Dr. Aston as the author most frequently cited by others in the field of higher, higher education. We know that because we read it repeatedly. Uh, Dr. Aston's research has focused on how undergraduate students are affected by their college experience with particular emphasis on educa educational opportunity and equity, student persistence, career development, service learning, assessment and evaluation, and institutional transformation. So without further ado, let's get this conference started right with Dr. Aston. Thank you, Kat. Um, I just wanted to say a word on behalf of my uh, lifetime partner and uh, a very uh, ill wife who uh, petered out on the uh, night before last <laughs> and is on heavy duty antibiotics. And I, I talked to her just half an hour ago, and uh, she sent her warmest best wishes to uh, everybody here and her regrets for not being able to uh, make it. Uh, so I'm going to give two talks tonight. <laughs> I'm going to get mine and hers together. and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, hopefully I'll do justice to her, her part of it. Um, coming back here uh, to Tallahassee and to the Institute is a little like coming home. Uh, Elena and I have been participant speakers, as uh, Kat mentioned, uh, a number of times in the past. And on each occasion we've come home feeling inspired and renewed by the topics, the conversations, and the friendships. In preparing uh, our talk for this evening, we were asked to do a sort of retrospective uh, and uh, to uh, consider the themes and, and uh, emphases of the various institutes over the years and how it relates to our own work. Um, and uh, the, I'd like to begin this talk with a little personal history of our efforts to study character development and equity in higher education, topics that are both central to the Institute's agenda. Back when we first got involved in studying college students some 50 years ago, these two topics were generally treated as separate issues. In fact, they still are by a lot of people. You know, what do values have to do with equity? You hear this kind of question asked. Over the years, we've come to see how intimately connected they can be. So part of my intent tonight will be to show what Lena and I have learned 
from our research on equity and character development and how the two topics are interconnected. We've organized our research work. Um, let me see if I got this thing working correctly. Look at that. Isn't science wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, think I just had surgery for a detached retina and I'm still not looking at, at very clearly at things. Uh, I don't recommend anybody getting to detach retina. Uh, <laughs> uh, so forgive me if I squint uh, now and then. Uh, we, we've organized our research work more or less chronologically into five related topics. Um, equity, value and character development, <clears throat> leadership, service learning, and civic engagement, and finally, spirituality. As it happens, these same five topics have overlapped with the themes of just about every one of the Dalton Institutes over the years. We checked each institute and all the themes. So to locate this research work in a larger context, I'll also mention uh, relevant historical events as well as selected key works by other scholars. But if you see that chart there, we cover just about every institute. I think there are two of the of the, uh, uh, of the institutes that are not covered by those five research topics that I'll be talking about. Let's start with the one that connects directly to the topic of this institute, equity. And I guess for Lena and me, this has been our favorite topic. And we got involved in it very early in the game. America's struggle over equity issues has a long history. Perhaps the seminal scholarly work in this field, and I bet you not many of you folks have read this, I, I would urge you to go back and read it. It's a very profound work. It's Gunnar Myrdal's classic 1944 book, An American Dilemma. How many people have read that? Not, not many. Uh, check it out. It is so current today. It exposed the fundamental conflict between a nation that professes values of freedom and equality on the one hand, and the second class status and second class treatment of African Americans on the other. And it's a brilliant uh, analysis of, of that kind of fundamental contradiction in our society. It wasn't until 20 years later that Fred Crossland of the Ford Foundation documented the extraordinary racial inequalities in our higher education system in his 1971 book, Minority Access to College. Throughout most of her professional life, Lena's scholarly work has focused on issues of equity for women. A good deal of the impetus for this work is provided by her own personal experience as a young woman PhD in psychology trying to find a job, and also by being herself a participant in some of the unrest that the uh, women stirred up during the early years of the women's movement. Um, Lena was a kind of quiet and, uh, but a very effective participant in that. Um, and I, I might commend to your attention, I now I'm selling books, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> Lena just finished her autobiography, uh, and uh, it, it's called The Road from Sarah. She was born in a, in a little town in Greece, in northern called Saris, and subtitled A Feminist Odyssey. And uh, check it out. It is it's cheap. And, uh, <laughs> and I think you'll really find something to connect to in, in that story. And, uh, that's the only commercial tonight. I won't give any others. Her first book, The Woman Doctor in America, which was published in 1969, appeared just as the woman's movement was beginning to gather steam. The considerable interest generated by this national study resulted in part from the fact that it debunked several myths about highly educated women, including the belief that they don't remain in the workforce because they drop out to have children and raise families. It also documented the existence of sex discrimination in the university workplace. For the next 30 years, Lena continued to work on issues related to women in higher education publishing books and articles on topics ranging from the adult woman 
to women's career development, to pay equity for women's faculty. That one still is the seven, I might add. Over this same period, she's also remained an activist on behalf of women in higher education, serving in leadership roles at UCLA, as well as the American Psychological Association and other national professional associations. Now, while Lena and I both believe that women in higher education have made tremendous progress since the late 60s, and while issues of equity for women have to a certain extent fallen off the policy issues radar, there remain a number of unresolved issues such as salary inequalities, sexual abuse, continuing barriers to high prestige occupations, and leadership roles. My own early research on equity issues, which also dates back to the 60s, highlights the hierarchical nature of our higher education system. Now, higher education in this country has been seen, particularly by foreign observers, as very equitable and an open access system, mainly because of its extensive community college system. Now, I tried to argue in this early work that the internal structure of the system was in reality, very hierarchical and elitist, and the most excellent institutions available only to a small segment of the student population. And because selective admissions was based heavily on standardized test scores, poor students and underrepresented minority students were denied equal access to these elite colleges and universities, and they still are. Uh, they're represented about half that you would expect from their uh, enrollment in the entire higher education system, and that hasn't changed in three decades. Despite the expansion of affirmative action admissions programs and tremendous growth in federal and state financial aid programs, these inequities have, as I said, remained in place. In fact, our most recent research on this topic suggests that, if anything, access to top-ranked colleges by middle-class students is actually on the decline. Lana and my earliest collaborative work dealing with equity issues re was reported in a book which nobody remembers, but it's worth checking out. It, I'm not selling it. They're giving it away. <laughs> Published in 1972 called Higher Education and the Disadvantaged Student which we wrote in collaboration with colleagues and Visconti and, and High Frankel. Following the turbulent era of the civil rights movement in the late 60s, a number of colleges and universities across the country initiated special educational programs aimed mainly at African American students, many of whom were being admitted under newly established affirmative action programs. Our study, which involved an in-depth analysis of a diverse sample of these programs found that academic preparation and motivation were much more important determinants of college success than were the student's ethnicity or social class. Nevertheless, participation in these special programs appeared to enhance academic performance. Somewhat surprisingly, minority students also performed better, check this out, if they attended a highly selective elite institution than a non-selective one. So the notion that they, quote, weren't qualified to be admitted to such institutions is a myth. Close on the heels of this study was our evaluation of the open admissions program at the City uh, University of New York, an extremely pioneering program. Open admissions was implemented across the university's 15 undergraduate campuses in the fall of 1970, following a long series of protests. All new freshmen had taken basic skills tests when they finished high school, so we were able to repeat these tests at the end of the freshman year to measure change from entry to exit at the freshman, in the freshman year. Our study, which was carried out in collaboration with colleagues Jack Rossman and Elaine L. Kowas yielded two findings of significance. That so-called remedial students do better if their classes are mainstreamed rather than offered in separate remedial tracks. And that during their first undergraduate year, these same students, who wouldn't have been admitted before 1970, 
were able to raise their reading and math skills up to the level of their regularly admitted classmates as tested when they graduated from high school. This finding clearly showed that specially admitted students, given the opportunity, are capable of college level work. They just need extra time. Another large scale project that Lana and I initiated in the late 60s involved campus protests. I, I can't begin to tell you what uh, the problems we had in those days, but those are long gone days, but uh, uh, they thought we were the FBI coming on the campus. And, uh, man, I didn't wear any coats or hats, uh, that's for sure. Uh, we carried our longitudinal analysis of how students and campuses were being affected by protests, as well as in-depth case studies of several campuses across the country. The results were published in a 1975 book entitled The Power of Protest, which we wrote in collaboration with the late Al Baer and Ann Visconti. One of our major findings, which in part suggested the title for the book itself, was that protests actually work, especially if they have to do with racial issues or with students' rights. Campus has implemented a number of changes in response to protests by black students but were not as responsive to protests having to do with the Vietnam War. In fact, they pretty much stonewalled on the issue of the war. A finding of potential relevance to present day racial protests, I'm thinking here of Ferguson et al., is that a demonstration was most likely to end up in violence under two conditions. This was a very, very complex and detailed analysis we did. When the administration refused to negotiate with the protesters, and when police were brought on the campus. Institutions that negotiated with protesters and that uh, avoided bringing police on the campus were not uh, uh, as likely to experience violence. During the latter part of the 1970s, and especially during the 1980s, there were a number of attempts by conservatives uh, to outlaw affirmative action on the grounds that it discriminated against white students. One of the earlier pivotal events was the 1978 Bakke case. I'm sure, sure you students uh, maybe have never heard of that, but uh, it's worth checking out. Where a white applicant sued the University of California claiming he had not been accepted to medical school because he was white. Actually, it was because it was older than they wanted in the medical school, but that's beside the point. His claim was it was a racial discrimination. In anticipation of a ruling that might outlaw the use of race in admissions, we carried out a simulation study using our SERP data and college board data to see if the objective of affirmative action to admit more underrepresented students could be achieved without relying on the student's race through the use of what we call the disadvantagement index, which consisted of a weighted combination of the income and educational levels of the student's parents. The study, which was co-authored with Bruce Filler and Casey Green, was published in 1978. As it turned out, we were able to show that proportionate numbers of black and Latino applicants could be admitted by adding the disadvantagement index to test scores and grades but the index needed to be given substantial weight. Since the toughest barrier for minorities turned out to be standardized test scores, the index worked best when it was combined with high school grades alone rather than with grades and test scores. Today, the college admissions battle continues to rage on in the courts with the current conservative majority in the US Supreme Court threatening to outlaw affirmative action altogether. A few institutions, notably the University of California, have incorporated disadvantagement measures of various sorts into their admissions procedures. However, so far only a handful of institutions nationally have abandoned the use of test scores altogether. But an increasing number have been adopting a test scores optional policy, which helps to create a more level playing field for underrepresented students of color. Possibly our most ambitious research effort in the equity arena was our national study 
Minorities in American Higher Education, which was published in 1982, the National Commission that oversaw this study made a number of policy recommendations based on their findings, most notably that community colleges, which enroll a disproportionate share of underrepresented minorities, should encourage and facilitate full-time attendance among their traditional age students, 18 to 22 and establish a college within the college that can serve exclusively transfer students. Such a college could incorporate many of the features of four-year residential colleges that have been shown to enhance the undergraduate experience. Under, unfortunately, more than 30 years later, we see little evidence that these recommendations have been implemented and community colleges continue to experience very high attrition rates especially among students from underrepresented groups. Let's turn now to the topic of values and character development. And I'm going to go through these other topics quickly and then, and then try to pull this all together around the theme of the conference. One of the most important contributions of Art Chickering's landmark 1969 study, Education and Identity, was to underscore the fact that values and character should be at the center of our efforts to under educate undergraduates. Other seminal works that helped to draw our attention to the affective side of student development included Joe Katz's No Time for Youth and Nevitt Sanford's The American College. And I would commend all of these books to your attention. I'm sure most of you have read Chick's book, but the other two as well. <laughs> From the very beginning of our national studies of college students in the early 1960s, our surveys of entering students included a number of questions concerning values. When we initiated the CIRP in 1966, a number of colleagues looked at the questions that related to attitudes, values, and self-concept and said, Sandy, what does this have to do with undergraduate education? But we persisted over the years and were able to assemble a fascinating portrait of how college students' values were changing over the decades. This fall, we'll conduct our 50th annual freshman survey. One set of trends that particularly caught our attention involved the value of developing a meaningful philosophy of life, which declined precipitously. It started out in the early 70s as the top value for students, with over 80% endorsing it. And it declined and declined during the 70s and 80s, and even up to the present day, so now it's below 50% endorsement. At the same time, the value of being very well off financially <coughs> soared in popularity during the same period. Our sense that these contrasting trends might have something to do with the advent of frequent television viewing in the American household was confirmed by the longitudinal finding that during college, excessive television viewing is associated with a strengthening of materialistic values. And it's still today. We've replicated that finding maybe six, seven times. Together, television, a weakening of the student's commitment to developing a meaningful philosophy of life. In the most recent survey, which happened to be released today, actually, um, being very well off financially reached its all-time high of 82% endorsement, while developing a meaningful philosophy of life remains at its relatively low position of 45 in the hierarchy of values. Over the years, several large-scale longitudinal studies of value change during the undergraduate years have been carried out at UCLA's Higher Education Research Institute. And uh, those of you who have studied higher education as a discipline have probably been tortured having to read these. I'm thinking of uh, four critical years back in 1977 and 1993, uh, the sequel, What Matters to College. Uh, can't even begin to summarize all the findings in these uh, books, but the main thing that we discovered was that the students' values get mostly shaped by the values of the peer group. That's, that's where the real effect uh, occurs. Now the other two areas of research where values come into play 
uh, our service learning and leadership. Many studies on leadership have examined leaders' behavioral traits, but have avoided the question of leadership to what end. However, in 1980, uh, Rita Sherry and I became interested in finding out how leadership style impacted student development. This is one of my many unread books. Uh, uh, for our book, we collected data simultaneously from administrators and students at 47 institutions to determine if the college's approach to leadership could in any way have implications for student development. And as it turned out, favorable student outcomes were associated with what we call the humanistic approach to governance, where, and this is what we meant by humanistic, Interpersonal skills were highly valued. There was frequent communication among all constituent groups. And where the president tended to take an egalitarian approach in dealing with others. The least favorable student outcomes were associated with what we call the hierarchical approach, where administrators communicated more with the president than with each other, where personal ambition was the primary trait that was rewarded and where the president's operating style tended to be bureaucratic. Naturally, none of the higher education administrators have paid any attention to this book, but uh, <laughs> uh, it, it cuts a little too close to home. <laughs> a decade later, later, Lena and her colleague Carol Eland carried out an in-depth study of 77 prominent women leaders. These were really top, top drawer leaders who, who who had been identified as instrumental in helping to bring about social change on behalf of women. The major findings were reported in their book, Women of Influence, Women of Vision. They found that the women leaders were value-driven in their leadership, were passionate about issues of justice, shared strong convictions and commitments to social justice and change, and saw their leadership as a collective effort, not as something a person does something the group does. In other words, leaders of social change emphasize collective action, shared power, and have a passionate commitment to social justice, equality, and inclusion. So after these two works, Lena and I decided, well, let's, let's get together and do something together on leadership. So we joined together to develop what we call the social change model of leadership development. Uh, crafted in collaboration with a working ensemble of leadership experts, mainly from uh, student affairs, the social change model was entirely value-based, based on seven values. We're gratified that the model has generated a lot of interest over the years, and with further leadership from experts like Susan Comavez, it continues to be used in leadership training on many campuses across the country 19 years after it was released. And our final topic, civic engagement and service learning. Uh, one of the most significant developments in higher education during the 80s was the growth of interest in service learning and civic responsibility. In recognition of the importance of engaging students in service work, in 1985, the presidents of Stanford, Brown, and Georgetown universities joined together with the chair of the Commission of the States to form the Campus Compact, a coalition of college presidents who've committed their institutions to promoting student involvement and community service. The Compact has now grown to 1,100 members, and these are the presidents involving their institutions. Perhaps no one has written more about civic engagement in higher education than Ann Colby and Tom Ehrlich. Their initial book in a series that they produced in the last uh, decade and a half was uh, published in the year 2000 under the title Educating Citizens. Another pioneering work in this field was the monograph series published by the now defunct organization AAHE, starting around the same time which showed how service learning could be introduced into academic courses in 22 different academic disciplines. During the early 80s, our institute had become involved in a series of large-scale studies designed to assess how and why 
students become involved in service work and what impact that work has on their development. This is just an example of one of the studies there. We've also done several studies on uh, faculty attitudes and involvement in, in service. Participation in service turns out to have positive impacts on a wider range of student outcomes than almost any other curricular or co-curricular experience. When in doubt, get the students involved in service. You're going to get tremendous mileage out of that. Cognitive, affective, value-wise, and so forth. These outcomes include a variety of post-college uh, measures uh, such as higher levels of civic engagement after college, uh, value changes after they leave college. These differences show off not only in behaviors such as voting, donating money to charity, and working with others to solve community problems, but also in their attitudes like commitment to becoming a community leader, promoting political and social change, and working to promote racial understanding. All these values are strengthened post-college by participation in service during college. <coughs> Finally, we come to spirituality. Lenna's and my interest in spirituality was, uh, oh, sorry about that. I, I missed one of those. Our interest in spirituality was stimulated in part by our participation in retreats hosted by the Fetzer Institute during the late 90s and by our subsequent affiliation with a small group of retreat, retreat participants who continued meeting well into the 2000s. And uh, we have three of them uh, here tonight. Mark Chickering was one, but we have John Dalton, uh, Cheryl Keene, and Jim Keene, who were all members of that uh, kind of informal group that met and talked about issues related to spirituality. These sessions convinced us that it was time for higher education to give more attention to the inner lives of students, faculty, and staff. Our first effort in this area involved in-depth personal interviews with faculty in four diverse California institutions, which culminated in a 1999 monograph, Meaning and Spirituality in the Lives of College Faculty. What surprised us was that over 95% of the faculty we interviewed were able to talk freely about spiritual issues in their lives, believe it or not. And we had two research universities in, in, in this sample. Even though their institutions rarely, if ever, offered opportunities to explore such issues. It was in the early 2000s that interest in spirituality within higher education began to show significant growth. In 2002, the AACNU hosted a national conference on spirituality and learning. And in 2005, two members of our small spirituality group, John Dalton and Art Chickering, together with their colleague Lisa Stan, published Encouraging Authenticity and Spirituality in Higher Education. Among many other important features, their comprehensive volume integrated historical and cultural perspectives with practical advice about how to reshape institutional programs to give greater attention to the spiritual dimension of the student experience. In 2003, the Templeton Foundation awarded us a grant to initiate a large-scale longitudinal study of student spiritual development, which culminated in the release of the book Cultivating the Spirit, which we uh, wrote in collaboration with Jennifer Lindholm. This eight-year study, which Len and I reported on at the uh, 2010 Dalton Institute, not only underscored the importance of spirituality in the lives of college students, but also demonstrated the close connections among the topics that we've attempted to cover today. Values of character, equity, service and civic <coughs> responsibility, leadership, and spiritual development. I want to share a few examples to close with of these connections among these different areas of work. But to do this, I first need to review briefly the five dimensions of spirituality for which we develop measures in our study. And I really think that it would behoove us all who work with students to think about these aspects of, of the development of each student we work with. So the five measures briefly are 
spiritual quest which reflects the degree to which the student is actively seeking to become a more self-aware and enlightened person and to find answers to life's mysteries and big questions. Then there's equanimity which measures the extent to which the student is able to find meaning in times of hardship, feels at peace, sees each day as a gift, and feels good about the direction of her life. Then comes charitable involvement, which is a behavioral measure, including activities such as community service, donating money, and helping friends with personal problems. The fourth one is the ethic of caring, which reflects the student's commitment to values, such as helping others in difficulty, reducing pain and suffering in the world, and promoting racial understanding. And the final measure, ecumenical worldview, indicates the extent to which the student is interested in different religious traditions, seeks to understand other countries and cultures, feels a strong connection to all humanity, and believes that all life is interconnected. I'll close my talk tonight by providing a few examples from our spirituality findings to show how spiritual development brings together the four other topics with special emphasis on educational equity. First, let's look at service and civic responsibility. It turns out that when students participate in service learning during the undergraduate years, they show greater than average growth in three of these five spiritual qualities. Equanimity, spiritual quest, and ecumenical worldview. If we turn now to look at leadership, we find a similar pattern of effects. Participation in leadership training enhances growth in three spiritual qualities. Equanimity, charitable involvement, and ecumenical worldview. Now to turn it around, at the same time, growth in equanimity enhances students' leadership self-concept. When it comes to the spiritual growth and character development, there are too many findings to talk about, so let me just give a brief sampling of of some of the values that are enhanced by charitable involvement. Helping others in difficulty. Reducing pain and suffering in the world. Improving the human condition. Accepting others as they are. And believing in the goodness of all people. These are the kinds of values that when students get involved in charitable activities that are strengthened. These are all very carefully controlled studies and everything. Finally, when it comes to the question of how higher education can best promote the cause of educational equity, one of our spiritual qualities, ecumenical worldview, takes on special significance. When students' ecumenical worldview shows substantial growth during the college years, their commitment to promoting racial understanding is strengthened and they feel more confident in their ability to get along with other races and cultures. In reflecting on the topic of this year's institute, Lena and I have come to the conclusion that since the structural barriers that stand in the way of achieving greater equity for students, and by this I mean a hierarchically structured system of institutions, continuing heavy reliance on standardized test scores, diminishing state support for public institutions, to name just a few, they show little sign of change, despite all of our best efforts uh, in the research field. It makes little sense, then, to continue focusing a, a lot of energy on trying to change these structures. I'm sorry to say, but that's not something we can do directly, but I think it's something we can have an impact on indirectly. We believe that the research that I've reviewed tonight points in a different direction, one that's much more amenable to the direct efforts of those of us who work in the higher education field. I'm speaking here of the manner in which we educate our students. Since it is the students who are destined to become the next generation of leaders, public servants, and engaged citizens, how they view the issues of economic, racial, and educational equity is what will eventually shape the policies that can address these structural problems that continue to stand in the way of achieving greater educational equity. 
And it's our higher education institutions that can help to shape the character and develop the leadership qualities of these same future leaders and citizens. What I'm really suggesting here is that the biggest contribution that we who work in higher education can make to the cause of equity may well reside at the level of the individual student. By working to enhance students' spiritual and moral growth, we can help create a new generation who are more caring, more globally aware, and more committed to social justice than previous generations, while also enabling these students to respond to the many stresses and tensions of our rapidly changing society with a greater sense of equanimity. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have a few minutes that we're going to do a couple of questions. Not, not too many, everybody. Don't get overwhelmed. Um, so if anybody has any questions, we have some uh, lovely gentlemen with some microphones. Just wave your hand. service is unpaid and so therefore students have to kind of balance the idea of I want to engage in this but I also need to you know, feed myself and maybe my family as well. Do you have any thoughts on how we can create structures or ways to engage low-income students specifically in service? Uh, well for one thing uh, we need to work on the faculty to uh, extend uh, service learning opportunities and more courses and uh, e even though AAHE is defunct, uh, th that monograph, those series of 22 monographs still exists, and that, that's a great starting place, because they have fields you would never expect, physics, and engineering, and so forth, where they show how you can develop service learning. We need to familiarize the faculty with some of this research. The research is very powerful on the educational benefits, not just the value benefits, but the uh, learning benefits of service learning. Uh, so I think that's, that's one clear approach, is to, is to basically uh, extend this in courses that students are going to take anyway. Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, my, my name is Dylan Bowen. I'm an uh, undergraduate student at Rollins College. and. One thing that's been talked about for years and years and years is a better uh, spiritual education in school. We've got a great mind, a great body education, but um, spiritual education is just lacking where it should be. Um, I think one thing that's been a difficulty is that a lot of the students don't seem very open to the idea of a spiritual education because I think they related a lot to a religious one. And we you know, go to a non-denominational school, um, so I think a lot of students are uncomfortable about it. What, what would you say would be a good suggestion to try and open up that conversation so that students might be able to open up, be a little bit more open to the idea, talking about that, because spirituality means so much more than just that. Well, I think uh, certainly to uh, sit down with the religious life folks and uh, have a conversation and familiarize them with some facts. In the average institution, uh, almost one quarter of the students say that they are spiritual but not religious. So when the religious life folks together you say, oh well let's have a, you know, let's get together and talk and talk peace with each other and across the different uh, faiths, that these students, there's no place for them. I mean I really I really think we need to make a place for students who don't affiliate with a particular denomination or might not even uh, believe in God, who knows? but who, who see themselves as spiritual beings and who want to develop those qualities in themselves. Another, another uh, uh, approach is to, uh, for example, at Carnegie Mellon University, they have what they call a big question seminars where faculty agree to come into the residence halls and conduct ongoing seminars 
on big questions which the students submit, you know, what, how do you reconcile all of the evil in the world with a loving God? Or, you know, that's just an example of the kind of big question. Students think about these things. They don't talk about them, but they think about them because these seminars at Carnegie Mellon were oversubscribed. Students really got engaged in talking about these big questions. So to find more ways to engage students in reading and writing and talking about big questions, and that, of course, relates to the spiritual quest uh, measure. Uh, it helps students who are interested in, in, in questing, if you will, and it doesn't necessarily involve anything having to do with uh, formal uh, religious faith. Thank you. Um, what are the next steps, or what kind of direction would you like to see in form in terms of spirituality research in the future? Well, uh, first of all, we, we just barely scratched the surface. That, that I really think that maybe the main contribution of this study were those five qualities. That it was a two and a half year development effort to develop measures of these qualities that we really trusted. And uh, they seem to go down well with both religious and non-religious folks. I mean, when you describe, here's what we mean by spirituality, and, and the religious folks are fine with it, uh, at least once that we've talked to. And there is a lot of interest in our study uh, in both secular and, and, and sectarian institutions. Uh, so I think Further work with these five qualities is indicated, and there's so many things you can do. One thing is to see in much more depth how development of these qualities can be facilitated by student affairs folks, for example. Uh, what kinds of activities? We know that service learning is one method for doing this, study abroad. And if there were one thing that we could all do, faculty and student affairs folks and administrators, it would be to encourage more students, this relates back to the time question before, that more students engage in reflective activity and in um, meditation. Uh, there's so much accumulating evidence on the value of taking even five minutes a day to go somewhere and be quiet. Uh, and, and, and the value of that in all, in many aspects of student development, one quality which it particularly helps to develop is equanimity. And boy, do we need more equanimity in our students. You know, the, uh, the uh, survey that I mentioned that just was released today indicates students are entering college more stressed than ever as, as a group, as a new population of 1.6 million new freshmen are more stressed than ever. And of course, all the longitudinal studies during college indicate that whatever stress you start out with gets worse during college. And uh, what do you know? If you're able to develop your equanimity during college, that slows down that uh, whole uh, stressful kind of development that occurs for most students. So again, student stress can be, oh, and also your GPA gets better. How about that for equanimity? Uh, so the, the, the point is, is that there, there are so many different benefits to uh, developing these spiritual qualities. Um, and of course, the ecumenical worldview and the ethic of caring are, are critical kinds of qualities to develop. If we're going to produce a generation who are going to go out there and do something about our social justice issues, those two in particular. One more question? A big crisis in higher education now is the completion rate and how there are disparities, especially among different groups within the United States. And I just wanted to ask you about your thoughts on connecting <coughs> spirituality, involvement, engagement, and completion. Just any reflections or thoughts you have about that topic. It's, it's worth noting that the notion of involvement came to my, into my head in a hotel room in Chicago. Uh, in 1975, when I was sitting, getting ready to keynote a meeting, 
And I had all of the findings of, from um, a book called Preventing Students from Dropping Out that I wrote in 1975. And so I looked at all these findings and I said, well, is there anything that ties them all together? They seem so disparate all over the place. And that's where the idea came to my mind. I said, sitting on that bed in the hotel room with all my printouts uh, around, I said, it's involvement, it's engagement. It's something I learned about when I studied industrial psychology. Uh, we call it vigilance or time on task or whatever. But it's the idea of investing psychic and physical time and energy in something. Uh, Freud talked about cathexis, cathection, the investment of emotional energy in something outside of yourself. So if you can get students to invest that time and energy, uh, you've got half the battle won. And uh, uh, what, what in other words, the genesis of the involvement idea was research on college student retention. All of the things which we found to enhance retention <coughs> suggested some form of involvement. That's where, the, that's where the theory came from, actually. And then we explored it much more depth in four critical years and in the, all the other work, but basically that's where the idea came from. So certainly involvement is the key and, and, you know, one of the troubles with the community college is that you get a lot of students going there who have never had much of a success experience in school, uh, who because of that are kind of on the fence about, well, should I be doing this? Should I even be going to college? Uh, you know, it's, it's too much work uh, and so forth. Am I going to fail? So the motivation is marginal. And motivation is a big part of the whole involvement question. If, if you can't help the student get motivated, then, then they're probably not going to finish. So uh, I, I really think focusing on the involvement idea is, is a way to deal with the retention uh, issue. And, and you can be very creative about ways to engage students and involve them. And, uh, for some reason, George Koo changed the word to engagement. I don't know what that was all about. But, uh, for the life of me, I don't see any difference. But, uh, 